Um, and posting and recording to the Ethical Society's YouTube channel for the benefit of those who aren't able to return, uh, attend today. So you can let friends know that if they say, oh, I'm darn, I wish I had heard Brenda's talk. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Brenda Henty, who you might recognize from her previous Ethical Society presentations on owls. Tonight, she'll be presenting For the Love of Seabirds, Project Puffin and the Hog Island Audubon Camp. Brenda is a middle school ed educator in St. Louis and holds a master's in administration. She received the Emerson Excellence in Teaching Award in 2018 for her leadership in outdoor education with her students. She's a certified Missouri Master Naturalist and a volunteer at the World Bird Sanctuary. She's given presentations on owl, owls in the St. Louis Committee, Community, International Festival of Owls in Houston, in Minnesota, and to the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge in Oak Harbor, Ohio. She studied under world-renowned orth ornithologist during the summers of 2015, 16, and 17 at Hog Island's Audubon Camp off the coast of Bremen, Maine, which she will be telling us about tonight. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. Uh, let me share my screen here and we'll get started right away. Okay. All right. So, um, Yes, I'd like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to share with you. This is a brand new program that I put together um, specifically for this evening. And um, it is a passion of mine. Uh, it's something that um, has been with me ever since I attended Hog Island back in 2015. And just being able to see these puffins out on the coast of Maine and now to be able to tell that story of uh, the restoration process that that help these puffins to come back is, is very exciting for me. I'm also going to share at the end of my presentation a little bit about what Hog Island Audubon Camp is like, uh, so that if you would like to attend, you'll have a little bit of insight and information on that. And before I get started, I'd like to thank um, or acknowledge Stephen Kress, Dr. Stephen Kress for uh, giving me permission to use a lot of his photos most of the photos of the puffins are his. There are a few that are mine, and the video is mine that I will show a little bit later. So as I said, I, um, I attended Hog Island back in 2015 and 16, uh, 15, 16, and 17, and, um, and was just head over heels when I was actually able to see these puffins um, out on Eastern Egg Rock Island. Let me see if I can get this to work here. Okay, so here are some pictures of the most comical and charming bird in North America. I would easily put this in my top 10 list. Uh, they're looking very dapper in their black and white, uh, their bright orange bill and their bright orange feet. Uh, they use that bill for various things um, during the mating process. They'll rub bills with each other um, when they're finding a mate. Uh, you can tell the sex of the puffin by the bill and also the age and the health of a puffin. But here they are, beautiful puffins as an adult. And you can tell that they're adults because they are in breeding plumage with that bright colored orange bill. So before we get going too far, I just want to go over a few facts about the Atlantic puffin. Their population right now is estimated at four to five million in the world but that population trend is decreasing. And that's mainly due to the warming oceans uh, and climate change. The status worldwide is vulnerable, although along the coast of Maine right now, it is um, doing pretty well. Their lifespan is anywhere between 20 to 30 plus years in the wild, and they can fly up to speeds of 48 to 55 miles per hour. They can swim underwater and stay underwater for about 20 to 30 seconds, but they can swim faster than the fish that they're chasing when they're under the water. And they're really short little birds, about 10 inches tall when they're standing upright. And they weigh about 
the, the same weight as a can of soda or a bottled water. They live in the cold waters and they of 32 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and they need those cold waters because the fish that they need to eat live in those cold waters. And Iceland has the largest population of puffins today with about 60% of um, the worldwide population living in Iceland. So the Atlantic puffin is a bird of extremes. They live out in the ocean, far away from land for nine out of the 12 months of the year leading pretty much a solitary life. Uh, they face the harsh weather conditions and the wind, uh, hurricanes, tropical storms, anything that comes their way, not going back to land except for to breed. They have everything they need on the water. They drink the salt water and they have these salt glands above their eyes that um, when the blood goes through the salt glands, um, it will help extricate the extra salt and they'll um, kind of drip the extra salt out of their nose, which I thought was interesting. So yeah, they're on the sea for two plus three, four, five years before they come back for that first breeding season. And, and out at sea, far away from land, they really don't have a lot of predators. So about 95% of the adults will make it back to land year after year. So here are some adults that gather in colonies along the rocky coastline and the islands of the North Atlantic. And like I said before, doing that only to come back to breed, otherwise they're out on the open ocean. The Atlantic puffins mate for the long term, and uh, when they find a suitable mate, usually around the age of four or five. It could be as long as up to seven years old. Um, they will mate for life. And if they're four years old and they find a suitable mate, they will possibly build a nest in the burrow in the ground, but they will not actually uh, lay eggs that year. Uh, they'll just kind of check it out and take over a burrow or make a burrow. And they dig those burrows out with their feet. And you can see the sharp pointy toes and um, with their bill. The male does most of the work, but the female does some also. And uh, they use that when they're four years old, if they, if they find a suitable mate, they'll use that first year kind of as an engagement period with each other. And then come back uh, the fifth year and find each other again after being out on the ocean, separated from each other for the whole year for the other nine months and uh, come back and then hopefully nest successfully. So a baby puffin is called a puffling and puffins lay one egg per year. So it's a really long process to try to restore a puffin colony because of only being able to lay one egg per year. And uh, mom and dad both take care of the puffin, take care of the egg, they incubate for about six weeks and then they spend the next six weeks uh, feeding the puffin, just dropping off food into the burrows. Uh, the puffin chick never really comes out of the burrows. They don't need to. Um, and if they did, they would just be vulnerable to all the other seabirds out there uh, that could um, eat them. And, and eagles and other things that might be flying by. So then after those six weeks um, of incubation and six weeks of being reared in the in the nest itself. Then in the middle of the night, they'll just hop off the rocky edges and out to the ocean they go. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then they're out to sea for the next two to five years before they come back. So that's a little bit about puffins. And now I wanna get into the story of um, the puffins that used to live along the coast of Maine and now do. So by the late 1800s, puffins had been pretty much eradicated from um, all the coastal islands and the coastline of Maine. People were hunting them first for food and for their eggs, and then later they started hunting them for their feathers. And that could have been the end of the story, but thankfully it wasn't. Because Dr. Stephen Kress, back in 1969, when he was an Audubon instructor at Hog Island's Audubon camp, um, he 
had eager students that wanted to learn from him and, and see the, and know everything about the birds that they were seeing at the time, which were like these black guillemots. And that's one, a black guillemot is what Stephen Kress is holding here in his hands. So he, he had the vision of what if, or how could I bring back the puffins to these islands where they once lived? And he could just almost picture them there on those boulders and on those rocks. And, um, and, and the thought just never really left his mind. And he was almost, he, he can pretty much say he became obsessed with the idea of bringing these puffins back to Maine. So almost all the seabirds disappeared by the 1800s. We're talking um, guillemots, terns, gulls. And you think of all the gulls that you see when you go to the sea now, and they're just everywhere. Um, but even the gulls were gone. Um, northern gannets were gone. Cormorants were, go were gone. Almost all the, the birds were gone. And that was because of the extreme hunting for food, hunting these birds for food and for feathers. So Stephen Kress knew all of that, and he also knew that people were living on almost all the islands year round, even the outermost islands of Maine. And they were doing that because of the fishing industry. And in 1885, there were only two puffins left in the whole state of Maine. And that was on Matinicus Rock, which is shown here with the lighthouse. Uh, there was a small, there was another small colony uh, up in the, on the border of Canada and Maine, but um, in Maine itself, there were only two puffins left. There, there were also gulls everywhere. Stephen Crest saw the gulls, and this is back in the late 60s, um, but the puffins were gone. The herring gulls and the greater blackback gulls filled the islands. And here, this is a herring gull here with its chick. Beautiful birds. But um, none of the other seabirds that had once been there, especially the puffins. So the islands were overrun with gulls. And Stephen Kress had to wonder, how did these other birds live there before, before, um, before the European settlers came? I mean, what, what kept all the gulls in check back then? And here, here's a picture of um, a turn. Even the turns were gone. And these gulls are so aggressive and they're just so big that they'll eat the chicks. And I saw that many times when I was out there. Uh, the greater blackback gulls will just go after the babies that also um, are walking around on the same islands. They live in a communal colony and, and drown them. And then sometimes they'll try to eat them and swallow them, but it's it's I mean, I've seen it happen, but it's, it's com competitive for sure. So the turns were gone also. So not only was this happening on the land, but uh, there were things that were happening under the sea also. And basically the fishermen were overfishing and they were taking all the herring um, and using them to uh, for lobster bait. People were also damming up the rivers. And here's a picture of the uh, Penobscot watershed <clears throat> on the left of all the dams that clogged up the rivers and prevented the fish from flowing out into the ocean. So gulls were thriving right behind the fishing boats. They would use the herring for uh, baiting the lobster traps and the gulls were becoming garbage gulls and living where the people were. So what kept this population in check at one time where the gulls were not out of hand? <clears throat> well, the eagles, the peregrines, the osprey, they were all starting to make a comeback. Um, they had been hunted also. And also DDT had hurt them and uh, there were funds, the Peregrine Fund had been started in the late or early 70s, the late 60s, early 70s. And there was money there for that. People wanted to see the Peregrines come back. People wanted to see our national uh, bird come back, the eagle. 
And so there was money there for that, but there was not a lot of money and people interested in bringing back the puffins. They're a middle of the food chain uh, species that have smaller fish below them and bigger predators above them. Not a lot of people were interested in bringing back the puffins. And the uh, fur, fur hunting had pretty much stopped by that time. And uh, the mink were coming back and the otters were coming back. And mink can swim several miles in the ocean sniffing out a uh, seabird colony and, and chasing them off or eating them. <clears throat> so here's a picture of Eastern Egg Rock. This island is about eight miles south of Hog Island, Audubon Camp. Hog Island is about one fourth of a mile from Br Bremen, Maine. But Eastern Egg Rock, if you notice, if you can see it, um, it's all rocks. The whole perimeter is rocks. There's no trees on this island. And um, it's about seven acres. And this is where, one of the islands where the puffins used to live. And uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Sorry about that. So Stephen Kress had this idea that, you know, he wanted to see the puffins there. He wanted to be able to take people from Hog Island out to this area and show them the puffins that, that had once been there. And he got a lot of back Flash from people. What do you want to do that for? Why would you spend so much money trying to bring them back? If they want to come back on their own, they'll come back sometime. And besides that, if you if people really want to see puffins, why don't they just go to Iceland and see puffin? There's there's millions of puffins in Iceland, or there's hundreds of thousands in Newfoundland. But as I said before, Stephen became kind of obsessed with this whole idea and. He started reading literature and talking to people who knew something about puffins. And he found out, or he learned that puffin chicks, when they leave the burrow, that somehow magically they have a map in their head or, or somehow, they, we don't really know how they do this, that they learn where they hatched from. And he also knew that puffin chicks leave without their parents to go out to sea. And so he thought, well, if only I could get some puffin chicks and bring them to Eastern Egg Rock, put them in burrows in the ground and feed them for the next month, then they'll one night jump off the cliff and go out into the ocean and we'll be done. And they'll come back, they'll remember where they hatched from or where they were raised at this first stage anyway, but where they would normally hatch from. and life would go on and we could wrap this whole project up and be done. And we would have puffins on Eastern Egg Rock. Well, things didn't go exactly as planned like that, but this thought could not leave his mind. And it took him about the next three to four years to finally get enough uh, to get the permits, the, the permits that he needed, which were 13 different permits to bring some puffins from Canada, from Newfoundland. He got it from the Canadian Wildlife Service. Um, took him about three or four years to get these permits when they could just fly across the border without any permit. But um, he finally got those permits and off he went to Canada, to Newfoundland to get these, these checks. So in 1973, four years after his in initial thought of, of this plan, of you know, how am I gonna do it? I'm not sure, but I just gotta try. He was able to bring six puffin chicks back to Eastern Egg Rock. Left that morning, flew into Newfoundland, picked up the chicks, put them in a, a box, brought them back to Eastern Egg Rock that night and was putting them in hand burrows, hand dug burrows. So here he is at one of those, those early years of bringing the puffins back and putting them in the hand dug um, burrows. So living on uh, Eastern Egg Rock is quite the adventure. Like I said before, there's no trees, the winds come, the storms come, fierce, fierce winds, waves crash, sometimes spraying all the way across the island. But Stephen Kress and these biologists wanted to see this project through. And they would be out there in their tents and facing all kinds of dangers with the, with the weather. Uh, year after year, they 
found things out as they went. They found out that when the storms come, the burrows fill up with water. And in the middle of the night, they're out there trying to dig up the puffin chicks to make sure that they're not drowning. Because he has to prove to Newfoundland that these chicks are going to survive in order for him to get more chicks. And that first year, one of them did not survive. So five did. Uh, so let me go over. So in the next year after that, the first year in 73, he brought six chicks back. The next year in 74, he brought 50 chicks back. In uh, 75, he brought 100 chicks back. In 76, he brought 100 chicks back. And in 77, he brought 100 chicks back. A lot of hard, laborious work. And, and they were on, the, on Eastern Egg Rock Island probably from April, 1st of April through August, the mid-August, mid raising these chicks and just getting ready for them. So this is what a puffin chick looks like, all grown and ready to spend the next two and a half, two plus years out on the sea. They don't need that uh, orange bill because that's a uh, mate, um, something that they use for mating. But this is what they look like uh, to live on the sea. I think they're adorable, even at this stage. And, and really, this is the first time they come out, just right before they leave, they come out of that burrow. They don't come out ahead of time. But hopefully they're looking around and finding where they were from, that they can return one day or close by. So you can imagine after four years of bringing the chicks back and eight years after Stephen Cress's initial thought for this whole pro program, how excited Stephen was when he saw a puffin flying over the island. And it was also especially exciting because he could tell it was one of his because of the leg bands that were on it. It flew right over him. And that was a big day. But the puffins still were not nesting on the island. So he had to start thinking like a bird. He had to start thinking like a puffin. What can I do to get puffins to come to Eastern Egg Rock? And he knew that they were a colonial bird. So now this process is called social attraction, but he decided that he would make some decoys. And as soon as he put the decoys out on Eastern Egg Rock Island, pretty much probably within that same day, he said that the puffins started coming. They would come and they would land next to the decoys, they would poke at them with their bill, and they would fly off. They learned very quickly that they were not actual puffins. So he thought, well, I know that cardinals and other birds like to see themselves and see the reflection of themselves. I'm going to build some mirrors and put out there and maybe that will attract the puffins to come. So he did that and they came and he played sound recordings and they came, but again, they didn't stay for long. They figured it out. But year after year, the puffins continued to come. And now by 1980, some of these puffins were coming and dropping down into the crevices of the rocks and looking under the boulders and hanging around, but still none of them were nesting. This is a long time and he and people were getting upset because they're like, well, what are you doing this for? He was getting so much uh, criticism from people. You're just wasting your time with this program. But Stephen knew that if he quit now, that it would be a failure. All this hard work would be a failure. And he was, he was bound and determined to see it through. So you can imagine how excited he was on the 4th of July in 1981 when he saw a puffin coming back with a bill full of fish. He could tell it was his puffin because of the bands on the legs and it dropped down into the boulders and came back up without any fish in its bill. He knew then that they had a puffin that was nesting because this is just what puffins do. They come and bring back the food for the puffling and then pop back out without the food in their mouth. So it was very exciting. Eight years after he had first brought the first puffins to the island. 
So because of the Eastern Egg Rock uh, of um, National Audubon keeping the researchers on the island since then, they've been able to get information that tells a little bit longer story. So as you can see here, um, starting back in 1981 when that first chick or when that first uh, puffin came in with the food in its mouth, They've kept data of how many pairs of puffins are living on the island. And for about the first 15 years or so, there were, there were about 20 pairs that were nesting on the island. And then they don't know why, but all of a sudden, it, uh, the, the number of pairs started growing. And the more, that you, the more that you get coming back, of course, that's going to attract more also. Here, these two summers uh, was uh, a little bit warmer, so they didn't do as well there. And then as of last year, 2020, there are about 100, there were about 188 pairs. So it's very good news that these um, puffins keep coming back year after year and it's on, on the incline. And so to prove that this was just not a one-time type of experiment, Stephen decided to try it again. And this time bring puffins to Seal Island. And the same hard work, they, they, he brought another thousand puffins from Newfoundland as he had for Eastern Egg Rock. And sure enough, after eight years, they had puffins nesting on Seal Island. So now he has proven that this process can be repeated. It was a great accomplishment. So, Stephen was still wondering how long he was going to have to keep the researchers on the island. And he got to thinking, well, the, he, he got to thinking that the islands used to, the puffins used to live under this big umbrella of Arctic terns. And the terns nest on top of the land and would chase away the predators like the eagles and the gulls. So he thought, well, I just need to bring back the Arctic terns. And then they'll take care of the puffins for us and we can pack up and go home. So he used the same methods of social attraction where he put uh, decoys, this is a decoy here, put decoys on the islands and the male Arctic terns would even come up and try to feed the decoys. And they would try to mate with the decoys. Well, that wasn't going anywhere fast. And uh, they would play the sound recordings and they would play mating calls. They wanted it to be a happy island. <laughs> and, uh, and, it, and it worked. They started laying eggs right next to the decoys. So the turns were coming back. So because of the success, Project Puffin has gone all over the world. And behind every one of those red dots that you see, on the map is uh, one person who really has the, the gumption, the stamina to see different projects through. And it's been just a huge success. And people come to uh, Eastern Egg Rock Island to learn what they do there to help restore seabird populations all over the world. And the interns are still there learning other things while they're staying on the islands. This picture here on the right was the very first um, building that they put up after several years of being torn and tattered in their tents. Um, they decided to build this and they called it Egg Rock Hilton. And uh, this here in the middle is one of the blinds that they sit on a bucket in there for six hours at a time, watching out and observing the birds as they come by. Uh, and uh, they, they do all kinds of research. And right now what they're really doing is studying climate change. And these birds come and land very close to them. The puffins and the terns, they know that the researchers are friendly and the gulls and the eagles and everyone, everything else stays away as long as the people are on the island. So the researchers can see using binoculars and sitting in those blinds, what kind of fish the puffins are bringing back uh, to feed their young. And the Atlantic herring is what Stephen Crest calls a superfood. This is what they used to eat when the population was more, uh, was bigger than it is today. 
Uh, but they could see that the, the puffins would bring back herring to feed the young. They would also bring back these uh, white hake, which has these pointed tails here. And puffins can carry up to about 20 of these fish in their bill. And the top of their mouth has little spikes that help uh, the fish to stick to the roof of their mouth. But how they do this is they swim through the water, they catch the first fish, and using their tongue, they push it up against the back of their mouth, and they swim some more and open that lower mandible and just catch fish as they're swimming through the water. It's really amazing to see. They come up with a mouthful of fish, and the record that the scientists have been able to count was 62 of these fish in their, in their mouth. But normally it's about five to six to seven fish, but can most can see up to 20. There's also uh, junk food. It's not good for the fish. The butterfish, which is here, the puffer fish, and um, or I'm sorry, the butterfish here, which is extremely too large for these puffins to swallow. So the parents will bring back these fish that are not the right kind of fish, drop it off at the burrows, and then the babies try to swallow these fish, which they can't, and they're just not adapted to tear the fish. And um, sometimes they'll get them down, but not hardly. Sometimes they choke, but a lot of times they'll just, um, they'll die because of starvation. And the reason that they're getting these junk food fish is because of climate change. The other fish are moving north into the cooler waters. There are some new foods that are, have been seen lately the past few years. Haddock, this is the same type of fish that we have in our fish and chips when you go to the store. Um, and so this is good. There's good fisheries management going on with haddock right now and which is benefiting people and the puffins. So every year, um, there is a puffin cam that is put in a burrow on Seal Island. And this particular year, they had a puffin cam on Grace. And the uh, orange line here shows the surface temperature of the water. And the number of feedings per day that the parents are dropping off is here and the days go across the bottom here. So when the chicks first hatch, they usually feed them four or five times a day. And as they grow, they require more food. But this particular summer, there was a heat wave and the waters, the temperature of the water rose. And for a couple weeks in here, you can see that the feedings went down. Only one feeding that day, only one feeding that day. And it was um, not as much food as they needed to get bigger and fatter to get out on that ocean by themselves and survive. And you can see after the first couple weeks or after these two weeks, when the heat went back down and the waters cooled off, up so did the, uh, the feedings grew again. And surprisingly, the adults of all the puffins stayed longer about three, three weeks longer that year. And here is puffling grace. So this was at the the middle of that summer when the, when the waters were really warm. Uh, the fish go to cooler areas or they go down too deep for the puffins to, to go after them anymore or they swim too far away for the puffins to bring back the, the food and come back that distance. And you can see her kind of emaciated, her feathers are covering her scrawny body. And then as soon as that heat wave broke and she was able to get fed better, here she is um, looking like she's fatter and healthier and ready to go out to sea. So the scientists continue to stay on the island and uh, we're not sure how long they're going to be there, but um, the birds have learned to live with them and, and, uh, and, and it's, this is all possible because of people who care people who support the interns, people who support this whole project. And so today you can go on puffin watching tours and you know that part of your ticket price and the receipt will go back towards this um, seabird restoration efforts of, of Project Puffin. You can 
learn about puffins and watch them on at least five or six different puffin cams. And they try to get one on a burrow every year. And you can go to explore.org to find that. You can take an online course with Dr. Stephen Press and information is on Hog Island's Autobahn um, website. You can donate at projectpuffin.org. Uh, donate to help keep those scientists out there or you can even adopt a scientist for a summer. They like to keep the, the researchers out there for at least three weeks at a time, but they're there generally from uh, April to August. No running water, no electricity. They have to bring their own tent and they get food drop-offs about every three weeks and, and possibly be able to go back to the mainland. But other than that, they're pretty living in pretty rustic conditions. And you can also attend Hog Island Autobahn Camp. Is, and that is how Stephen Kress got started in this and that is how I got started in this. And um, this is the island here, this is Hog Island, which is about a fourth of a mile from Bremen, Maine. And it's about an hour north of Portland. So I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, what Audubon Camp is like. It's a lot of fun. There are six day programs that last all summer long. Uh, and it's just like when you attended camp, you don't get a lot of sleep, but it's a lot of fun. And you meet people from all over the United States. So when you first get there, you get a little orientation and then you get um, your room assignment and you can sign up for various things. There's cottages. If you want your own cottage, you have to pay more, of course, or you can just have a single room or a double room or a loft or whatever, but um, it's, it's fun. And so here's just some of the accommodations. There, there's running water, there's electric, there's your private bathrooms and showers. Um, we have the dining hall before each meal. Uh, one of the ornithologists uh, will read some type of a quote about nature or tell a story about nature before we sit down to eat. You have some leisure time that you can explore. This is the fish house here where we would have our nightly meetings or uh, classes. And um, yeah, that's Hog Island there. So we, we could, you could hike um, all over the island. It's a, it has a three, three mile perimeter. It's about, if I remember right, 350 acres or so. And uh, watch the beautiful sunrises. Uh, here are some, um, stuffed birds, which I learned how to stuff when I was there. It's very exciting, <laughs> um, but just it's just so exciting to be there and do all the different, have all the opportunities. Uh, we got to explore the intertidal zone and sane the um, water and pull up things and see what was there, which was also exciting. This is a piece of brown kelp, which was a very tall piece of brown kelp. Everybody was very excited to see that. Uh, we went looking for the midden, which is uh, the trash refuse that used to, that people used to use, the Native Americans and the Europeans who settled there before. All these little islands had some place on it that where they would dump their trash. And this man here in the white shirt, I don't remember his name, but he had it in his mind that we should go and try to find it. And we did. Uh, uh, walking on, we had to go all the way to the other side of the island, but this is it here and we could tell because all this white that you see here, see here is broken up um, oyster shells. And it's just mounds of it there. So we did find the, the midden, which was really fun to see. Here's some pictures of class. Um, this person here from uh, Cornell University was teaching us how to stuff the birds. Now, most of the people this year, this was 2015, came because they wanted to learn how to stuff a bird. I had no idea that that's what we were going to be doing, but these were birds that people had found that were already dead and they were going to stuff them or learn how to stuff them so they could be put into um, universities, museums or, or other places. So particularly this class here, my roommate for that year, she, she attended the second part of this class. I only got to attend the first part, but the second day he was pulling out the tongue of the bird and it flew across somewhere and we didn't know exactly where it flew. Well, my roommate found it later that night when she took a shower. So <laughs> that was interesting. And he said, oh, that happens all the time. <laughs> Eyeballs and tongues go flying everywhere. So that was interesting. Uh, here we were learning about bird banding 
Um, this right here is a recording device that they use to record audio of the birds' calls. But this is just some of the pictures of our class sessions. We also had time to go birding on the mainland and on the island. Here is a um, blue-headed vireo. We see these here in St. Louis also. Uh, we have the American bald eagle. We have bobolinx. This was over on the mainland that we saw this. The uh, a warbler, the um, black-throated green, and the northern perua. And of course, the osprey. They have an osprey cam on the island that you are told the very first day you're there when you're walking underneath the camera, you are not to say anything because everyone across the whole world will hear what you're saying. And then we got to do a lot of birding by boat out on Muscungus Bay. And you had to dress, you had to, you had to bring gear, you had to bring a um, gear for the rain and for the sunshine. And this was going out on Muscungus Bay away from Hog Island and this is the way you would go out towards Eastern Egg Rock. And this is one of the ornithology instructors, Scott Widensall, uh, who is absolutely wonderful, um, showing us one of the islands that we were going to go by. And I don't remember exactly what he was telling us. There are so many islands out there. And along the way, we saw more birds. And I was especially excited to see this northern gannet. This was in 2017, because northern gannets are one of the birds that are still having a hard time coming back. And northern gannets were hunted for food to feed cod, so for cod fishing. And it's still having a very difficult time. This is a bird that has a nine foot wingspan, flies over the open ocean and dives in to get fished. So I was really, really excited that I got to see one of these. Uh, these are storm petrels. And uh, we saw Black guillemots, which this is the very first seabird that I saw when I got on Hog Island. Um, they're noticed, noticeable by their white um, wings and their red feet. This is a common loon, which you would hear calling in the middle of the night in the early mornings. It was really pretty to hear that. We have um, double-crested cormorants up here, which come back year after year and build on the same nests. And sometimes you'll find five or six, 10 foot tall nests uh, columns going up from year after year. Uh, and so all of these other birds were coming back. These are eiders down here. These are the females. And this is the northern, uh, this is the male. Um, but all these birds were coming back except for the puffins and, um, and the gannets and the cormorants were having trouble too. But, um, or the cormorants were actually uh, used for cod bait also. But they were coming back because they had, um, they didn't have as as much special requirements that the puffins did. And they laid more eggs than the puffins do per year. They had a bigger clutch size. And then we saw lots of harbor seals, all the islands out there, you would see the, the seals laying on them or you would just be sitting out on the deck at Hog Island and the seals would come swimming by. Um, I don't think there's really anything different in the coloration of all these um, seals except for, I. If I remember correctly, the ones that had red on them were uh, nursing their pups still. And uh, one year, we got to take an adventurous landing um, on Ross Island, which was on a scale of one to 10 being the hardest to land on. It was about a seven. Eastern Egg Rock is definitely a 10, which we did not get to go on, but um, Ross Island we did. And uh, it was difficult to land on the rocks. It was, it was kind of scary. We had some, the, the waves were coming and pushing the boat on its side as we were getting in it to go back to the other boat. But we did some uh, bird studies while we were out there and banding of birds and also uh, recording of birds. And this is what we saw, the greater blackback and the herring gulls. And this is when I saw the greater blackback killing one of the herring chicks. And then later I saw it trying to swallow it, but it never could swallow it. It was a little bit too big. So these herring chicks that were on the island had just hatched. They, they were no longer, no older than seven days because seven days prior to that, uh, the ornithologists were on the island and none of them had hatched yet. So we were going to ban some chicks here and I'm holding herring gull that's probably about seven days old. It was very, very strong. 
stronger than what you can imagine. I was very surprised at how strong it was. Um, you can see some of the trash that gets put on these islands in, in this previous picture, I think, right here, of from the lobster traps. And all these islands are just littered with this, which is not good. And sometimes there's some cleanup days. When people land on Eastern Egg Rock Island in, in April, when the scientists get out there, they spend about the first week or so cleaning up the island from all the pollution. All right, so here we have Eastern Egg Rock Island, the world's first reestablished seabird colony. And here we have, they have these little outposts. There's another recording device. Um, so this one, I guess, was named Southie. But this is a decoy here. And the little puffins, they're so cute. They're just so tiny. I can't believe how tiny they are. So I have a little video that I want to show you. And in this video, you're going to look for the puffins on the water, not on the rocks. Um, and the first birds that you're going to see are black guillemots. But a little bit later, you will see the puffins come in. Come in and they're there the whole time. You just don't see them because they're over the other side of the wave. And the water was kind of choppy that day. And plus, remember, I'm in the boat. The boat's going up and down and forward, and so are the puffins. So it's a little bit difficult to get this video. But let's see here. Here we go. So those are the guillemots. Oh, I know. I just ran out of memory. Oh, look at all the close puppets. Here's yeah. the puppets. an end of the week celebration where we celebrate National Guillemot Appreciation Day where you're supposed to dress like a guillemot. So I put white wing patches on and I can't remember if I put red on my shoes or not, but here's, this is actually the very first picture I took of a guillemot. Um, you can see it's red feet and it's white wing patch. And uh, there's puffin cereal that you can eat for breakfast, which is actually put out by uh, the Barbaric Corporation, which you can buy it uh, Trader Joe's, and they give a portion of money every year to support Project Puffin. And the chefs on the island cook, bake these really great cream puffs that look like puffins, but you have to kiss them before you can eat them. And then we are seen off by the puffins as we take the boat to get back to the mainland to go home. So here is Dr. Stephen Kress with his book, where I got a lot of the information from. It's called Project Puffin. You can get it on amazon.com. Uh, it's about $20. If you want to know more information about how this all happened, it's, it's, it's a great read, uh, really interesting. And to hear all the, the trials and just the struggles and the hard work that he went through to bring back a, a bird and other species that people took out. Uh, so, founder and former executive director of the Seabird Restoration Program and vice president for bird conservation of the National Audubon Society for many years, he was ornithology instructor at the Audubon Camp in Maine on Hog Island from 1969 through 1981, and director of the camp from 1982 through 86, as well as one more time before retiring in 2019. And he's retired, but he's still working hard. I've had many interviews with him preparing for this, and. He's working just as hard. So I'd like to leave you with a couple quotes from Stephen Kress. Project Puffin was possible because of the help of many people, especially the interns li that lived on the islands and continue to do so. First in a role of restoration, now in the role of protection and data collection. 
It was also possible because of many ongoing supporters who understand the work and give to continue the program. Of course, having one person who commits their life to a project is also a big help. Look behind most successful programs for wildlife and you often find one person who sticks with it for the long term, who has the grit to go the long course, even against obstacles and naysayers. So this isn't the end of the story. Project Puffin has benefited 100 plus projects in over 14 countries, has helped stop plume hunting, has helped to reduce fisheries conflicts, has helped birds recover from oil spills, has helped move birds to higher ground because of climate change, has helped translocate birds off active volcanoes has helped restore seabird communities, not just single species, has helped seabird restoration on 13 islands of Maine's coastline, seven of them still managed today by Project Puffin and researchers, has helped hundreds of interns continue to do research and learn about conservation. Hopefully one day they'll be able to go from there and start their own projects, maybe not with seabirds, only with seabirds, but with other animals too. And it has helped bring every species historically known to breed on Eastern egg rock back. And I just wanna read that list of species that breed on Eastern egg rock today. Um, let me find that here. All right, there are puffins, guillemots, Arctic, common and roseate terns, laughing gulls, eiders, and leeches, storm petrels. You too are now a part of the story. The work is not done. Now there is recognition. If we do nothing, we can be certain the lack of action will result in extinctions. People need to be stewards of life on earth. Dr. Stephen Kress. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Carol would like to make an announcement before we go to the question answers. I'm, sure. I'm certain there's going to be a lot of Q&A and, and I know some people will not be able to stay the whole time. So I wanted to remind you that on March 15th, there's a special session. It is not on a Friday. It is a continuation of Don Beer's talk on multiple personality. That's Monday, March 15th at seven o'clock, the usual um, password, the, the usual, whatever you call that number. And then Zoom on, ID. On, thank you, <laughs> the Zoom ID. And then on April 2nd, which is our next first Friday, it will be Brian Vandenberg talking about hypnosis. I think that will be absolutely fascinating. And with that, Sharon, I'll turn it back to you for the Q&A. Okay. So um, we can do this. I can't see everyone. So maybe there might be some people that don't know how to use the chat or raise your hand function. If you do know how to use the chat or raise your hand, please do that. And um, I'll try to, maybe Carol can help me, try to I monitor people that have questions. And Brenda can help me too. Yeah, and Sharon, uh, do you need to turn off the recording now for the question and yes, answer session? Yes, I do. Thank you for that reminder. I have a big uh, note to myself and I turned my page. Uh, uh, okay. Hi, Sharon. It's part Closing of it off. 